Good day everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Ask Joe. Now here's your host, Mr Joe Gilder. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another rousing edition of the podcast. Yes, we had a guest intro, and if you're interested in making an intro for the podcast, I will happily consider using it. I can't promise I'll use it, but I can promise that I might think about using it, and I think that's pretty good. Uh, That was our good friend and faithful ass Joe attendee and VIP member, Ben Holmes, uh, who, as you might have guessed from that intro, is not an American. He lives over in the uk so ben you're awesome that was hilarious i think my name sounds way better in british so i might just refer to myself as joe gilda um just in perpetuity forever thanks so much for being here today is a good day it's a snow day here in nashville we got actually snow day yesterday uh no day off yesterday is martin luther king day and then today it snowed like four inches so the city shuts down no one's in school Uh, All my kids are here, so things have been noisy here. And then um, we're probably, they already canceled school tomorrow. So Pam, (laughs) say a little prayer for Pam as she has had all the children for many, 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 many days now. Um, But I didn't really work this morning, so I kind of hung out some and took them out sledding, etc. And yes, I must acknowledge Tiki Horea, another faithful Ask Joe-er, uh, had the suggestion of folks submitting uh, their own intro. So, Tiki, congrats. All these folks over in Europe are coming up with all the good ideas. They're kind of putting us Americans to shame. So, let's get let's get some good American ideas going here. I see a lot of good, familiar faces here. If you've never attended, if you're watching this video or listening to the podcast and you've never attended one of these live, it's really fun. Uh, aside from when I do the intro at the beginning and totally can't figure out how to get the audio into Studio One, <laughs> look who looks like a professional. Other than that, it's actually a really fun time. We hang out, I answer your questions here live on the podcast, and then we usually hang out for a while afterwards. It's on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Central Time. That's the same as Chicago, um, although I'm in Nashville. And um, every Tuesday, 1 p.m., you can actually subscribe to my calendar, homestudiocorner.com slash calendar. That'll get you, um, you can put that into your phone. It'll ping you five minutes before we go live. I don't know, who here in the chat actually uses that calendar? I know like one of you does, and I have no way of telling other than you've told me. So I'm just curious if that's if that's a thing or if I have just, just do that for absolutely no reason. But for me, it helps for me remember to show up. So I guess that's still pretty good. All right, so uh, what I want to talk about today is there's, there's a lot of things right, bouncing around inside my brain. Um, biggest one, and it's something I posted over in the Dueling Mixes forum yesterday, um, this idea of do you have somebody who, do you position yourself in a way where someone can come around and give you a swift kick in the rump when you need it? What I mean is, uh, do you have, do you put yourself out there when you have a goal or a thing that you want to do? Do you actually say it out loud? Do you tell anyone about it? And then do you even invite those people to hold you to it? A big, like one of the big cool things that's come from doing Home Studio Corner now in its 10th year, I think, is I have all of you and I say things like, I'm going to write 50 songs in 12 weeks or I'm going to release four EPs um, in a year. You are regularly asking me, hey, how are those EPs coming along? Hey, how are those songs coming along? And it's really motivating and really fun. And also, I get angry at you sometimes because you challenge me on things that I said I wanted to do. And when I'm feeling lazy and don't really want to do them, your challenge comes at a good time. But, you know, I get a little ticked. I'll be honest sometimes. But it's good. It's a good ticked off, right? Kind of the same thing happened uh, the other day with my wife. I had told her about some things business-wise that I wanted to do more consistently in this in 2018. Things that I kind of tend to let fall off the radar and don't do very well. And she looked at my calendar. I had planned out the month and said, hey, sis, I don't see the things you said you wanted to do, or I see them, but you pushed them off to the end of the month and you had said you didn't want to do that. I feel like you're not keeping your word on that. I did not like it when she said that. And as, you know, it's, it's conflict and all that, but it was really good for her, for me, for her to say that. And we were able to kind of say, you know what, you're right. Could you maybe help me reconfigure that and think through that a little bit more so when it comes to music and studio stuff and the things you've been saying you're getting around to for a really long time what are some of those that you can do and who can you invite into it 
Boom. That music starts, and I think, oh, I've got plenty of time to wrap up this thought. And then next thing I know, I'm just saying boom in the middle of a sentence. But, you know, we'll get there. Hashtag boom. So it looks like a lot of you, well, a fair number of you do actually use that calendar. If you don't see, if you have that calendar and you look right now, if you don't see today's Ask Joe on there, you're on the wrong one. I had to redo it uh, a few months back. So make sure you're subscribed to that new one. But, um, yeah, I'm glad to see that some of you use it. Who knows how long it'll, Google could shut it down one day. But right now it lets me post a public calendar and that's super cool. I try to put more stuff on there. Like I've been doing a few of these. I did one live songwriting session last week that I just did spur of the moment on Facebook. And it was really cool. Um, I've done videos where I write a song from start to finish, but I've not done it live like that. It was um, terrifying in a good way. So be on the lookout. I might throw some more stuff in that calendar. I don't want to overuse it because I realize it's... It's, it's intrusive if I do. Okay, so let's jump into your questions. If you have questions for me um, about really anything you might be dealing with that you think I might be able to help you with, obviously in the realm of music and audio, but we can also talk about business and snow if you'd like. I have a lot of it right now. Uh, but ask that in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer, and we'll do this. I've, I've started kind of going back to making these 30-minute episodes, getting through my spiel at the beginning really quickly, so we have a good solid 24, 25 minutes to just dive into your story and to help push you along where you need to go. So I'm going to jump into the questions. I will say I the when you're in the chat, it kind of just flows by as the more you're talking to me and to each other, so I will miss questions. I won't get to all of them, but I'll do my best. Um, if I don't get to yours after a good chunk of time, feel free to post it again. Just don't don't get all spamtastic on me. Um, let's see. There was one about the SM7 I just saw. Let me start with that one. And, of course, I lost it. Did you delete it? Wait, there it is. Uh, Ruben Hernandez says, are you going to... Are you going to, or have you gotten your Shure SM7B, I'm guessing you mean fixed? I haven't. For a long time, it had a buzz, and the gate that I use for this podcast pretty much made it where you couldn't hear it, but then I started to hear it. I, it, it could be a simple soldering thing. I just don't I don't solder, and I don't have that skill set. Um, but no, it's, it's sitting right behind you in that closet. I just need to get it done. This mic, the AKG D5, pretty good mic. We use these at my church uh, for just vocals. And I like it. It's not the best. I miss the SM7. I just have to, you know, make time to do that. It's not something I feel is super top priority, but it probably should be because it's a great mic. And it looks better. <laughs> looks are important. Will Paxson says hi and that I'm super dope. What's up, Will Paxson? <laughs> Tress Seaver. Is it Tress or is it Trey? I feel like we've interacted enough that I should be pronouncing your name better. So let me know, Mr. Seaver. It says, before calibrating, wow, my chat is bouncing like crazy. Before calibrating your monitors, how do you calibrate your SPL app? Um, I don't. I, I, I know there's a lot to learn about calibrating. SP, I literally, when, back when I calibrated my monitors, I got, I just searched for a free SPL app. Oh, I got a text from Graham Cochran. Hi, Graham. Um, I got a SPL app, just something free. And then I, I literally... At first, I was thinking, okay, you hear all the people say you need to mix at 85 decibels, SPL. I'm thinking, all right, fine, great. And then I got the thing out, and even if it wasn't accurate, 85 was stupid loud, like uncomfortable. I couldn't sit there very long. So maybe they were talking about live sound, or maybe people really mix at that volume, and that's why they're all going deaf. But I wanted something much more reasonable. So given that it was an app and not super accurate, I set it up in my mix position on like a music stand and I just played some music and got it at a volume that I enjoy. That's loud enough to hear things, that loud enough to feel a little bit, but not so loud that it's uncomfortable at a volume where I could mix for hours and hours without getting fatigued. And it it registered around 69 to 72 dB is kind of where it landed that felt right to me. So then I based my calibration on that. So I would have... Um, I forget how I did it. I would I would run pink noise at a certain level inside my DAW and then have that with with the master fader at zero and the pink noise at negative 20, I think, was the volume. I wanted that to all be hitting that 69 to 72 decibel volume, which means when I have a mix that is hitting negative 20 on the meter or if it's a K20, K-system metering, K20 
when you go from that that zero mark from where it's green to yellow, that's I think 20 dB below clipping. So you have 20 dB of headroom essentially, which works out really well. I never have to worry about clipping my mixes when I start them there. So I basically just said, okay, I want 20 dB of this average pink noise volume to be about 70 dB volume to my ears coming out of my speakers. And at this point, I don't even look at that meter very much anymore on my mix bus. I sit, I put my my mixing fader in the same spot. I have the volume on my speakers in the same spot. It's all been calibrated. And then I just turn up the faders. And if all the faders turned up are way too loud, I don't turn the speakers down. I don't turn the fader down on my mixer. I turn the tracks down in the software until they're at the level I'm used to mixing. Helps me mix more consistently. It helps all my mix bus processing. If I have presets that are already there in my template, they're ready to receive something at that volume, and it all works out real nice. So if you've never done anything like that, I actually have a a series of, I think it's a video or a, actually a, like a PDF guide where I walk through that in much more detail and probably explain it way better than I just did. Um, but that's available to my VIP members if you want to check that out. Um, it's in the archives. A couple years back I did that. And I literally set it up a couple years back, two studios ago, and I left it. I haven't touched anything. I leave it. That's just how I mix, and that's my setting. I, I just pray that these speakers don't die. They're not amazing, but they're mine, and I don't want to have to recalibrate and relearn new speakers. So if you want to be a VIP member, it's super cheap and super awesome. Uh, it's homestudiocorner.com slash VIP. And a thing I don't talk about much, if you sign up, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, if you go and add to cart, it'll actually um, give you a month for free. So you won't have to pay for the first 30 days. So you can go check it out for free right now. So check that out. For sure. All right. Milchin Stuff says, is there any reason to learn the Nashville number system? I know basic music theory, and uh, I'm totally fine with reading sheet music, so is there any reason to learn it? I would learn it... I, hmm, I find it to just be an easiest, an easy form of charting out songs. So for me, I use it because it makes my life easier. When I'm charting a song to record... I mean, first of all, I'm in Nashville, so all the players that are playing on the session will know that system. But it's really helpful also if I've done the chart out and then I'm playing along and it comes to tracking day and I realize, you know what, I charted it in D, we really should play it in E. You could either just visually transpose that in your head, which is fine, or it'd be even easier if it was all in numbers. I just scratch out where it says key of D at the top and write E and I'm off to the races. Or if I'm playing with a capo and I'm deciding, okay, we're going to play it in the key of E and then I'm going to play one pass through with the capo on the fourth fret. Well, guess what? I'm playing in the key of C there. And I, instead of having to write a new chart in C or remember, okay, C is, you know, the E is the one and I'm playing the one in C here. So when it's A, it's an F. That's a lot more mental gymnastics than just having numbers. I know I'm in the key of C with my hands, so I just play what the numbers say on the chart. So if, if none of those sound like things that you would do, or that would be helpful for you, then no, I don't think Nashville Numbers makes much sense for you. Um, but if there's the possibility of playing on a session or getting to play anywhere where that might be introduced, I think it's worth becoming familiar with it. I also would argue it makes you a better musician because it helps you to hear. You may think, okay, this song does D, G, A. And you may, the only way you remember that is, I just remember that it goes from D to the G to the A. And that's fine. But if you knew it as... If you saw DGA and you thought, oh, that's one, four, five, that's a different, that's a different part of your brain, or not really a different part of your brain, but it's a different way of thinking about it that I think would make you a better musician. So instead of saying this song goes from D to G to A, you say, oh, this goes from one, four, five. And you could think later when you're writing a song in the key of G, you could be like, well, I could do G C D and that might have that same feel as that other song I really like that went D G A. It's just it ex exposes you to more musically, and I think that's always a good idea. It's kind of like when I was growing up and learning guitar, I pretty much just taught myself. Uh, I would look at the chord, the, like the lead sheets that my parents had. They had sheet music, and it would have the little chart above that showed me how where your fingers go to play this chord. So I just slowly and painstakingly figured out the chords and started to learn how to do them. And I had taken piano lessons, so I knew basic piano, like quarter notes, half notes, rests, and eighth notes, and all that stuff, uh, dotted notes, all that. But when I went to college and had to take a couple of semesters of music theory, I just loved it. It was like all the stuff that I knew intuitively from just playing guitar started to make sense. And that's kind of how I feel about the Nashville number system. It's, it, it makes the music, it gives you a new vocabulary for the music and makes you a better musician, in my opinion. 
Jonathan Nosp says, Joe, when using guitar pedals, do you have any certain ones you like to send through the input versus the effects loop? That's a huge debate among all fancy guitar people. I don't have any sort of amp that has an effects loop. So I put everything in the front end of the amp. Um, I did play around with that a little bit using the 11 rack because it does have an effects loop that behaves much like an effects loop in an amp. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you can, there's a usually amp bigger amps with like a head and a cabinet. They have a loop for effects that comes after essentially the overdrive sound of the amp. So you could run into the amp, get your overdrive sound, and then send that sound out to your reverb and your delay. So typically like distortions and things like that on the front end delays and reverbs and maybe modulation stuff after the overdrive is the idea. I tend to, when I'm using pedals in a guitar amp, run something like my Fender Deluxe Reverb pretty clean, and so all my drive tone is coming from that blues driver pedal anyway. So I'm essentially running it that same way. I've got my overdrive tone, then that's going into delay and reverb. So the end result is about the same, but I am running it all into the front end of the amp. But there, I mean, most people would say that's kind of the traditional way to do it. You could certainly try all sorts of other approaches. You could um, you could run delay before your distortion. It may produce a cool sound, but then there's also a reason most people tend to put delay after. So something to think about. Gabriel says, or Gabriel says, to use the update project feature with the summer. I don't know what you're talking about, my friend. Oh, I see. It's a multi-part question. Studio One, new to Studio One, where's the mastering project page tech to take the mix export from? Um, if you need, he needs to print the mix in real time using an analog summer. If you're doing that, then you you can't connect the mix and project page really. Um, it's done offline bounce. It goes and bounces the song internally and then brings it into the project page. The only way that really works is if you print the mix onto a new track and then solo that track and then save that session and then use that as your session for bringing it into your mastering file. At that point, you've kind of lost the point of having the connection between the song page and the projects page or the session page and the mastering page. So I would say it doesn't doesn't really matter at that point. I would just probably manually bring them in. It, it is cool the way they connect. I don't use analog summing. I don't use outboard gear that I have to run through in real time. So I just don't, it's not a problem I've had to face. But I love keeping things in the box. And the way that it updates saves me so much time when I'm doing the job of mixing and mastering, which is what a lot of us are doing. John says, what is the most important plugin or type of plugins when it comes to mixing? The most important plugin is the one you know how to use. So the basics would be, in every mix I do, I probably have an EQ, compressor. Um, there may be a multiband compressor on the mix bus sometimes. I know some people say that's a bad idea. Um, delay, reverb, a couple different reverbs maybe, and a distortion plugin that I will throw on things as needed. That's it. Which delay, which EQ, which compressor? For me, a lot of times it's the stock plugins in Studio One. I am able to get a good mix with those because I know how to use them and I know the technique that you need to make the mix sound good. The tools are important. You need good tools. Um, but I just, I would rather obsess over getting new guitars and amps and sounds and keyboards and things like that and new percussion things that inspire me to make music. A new EQ just does not inspire me to be creative. So I just don't use them. I tend to use what I've got and I get the mixes I want. And to me, the thing that makes it get better or worse is when I've done something better or worse on the front end, not on the back end with a fancy new EQ. But if you want to dive into that world, I won't stop you. I will say I, I interact with a lot of people doing music in home studios, and I hear regularly people who've gone down the rabbit trail of kind of the addictive behavior of buying plug-in after plug-in, wasting... I mean, one guy told me $20,000 he spent on plug-ins until he finally realized he was not getting good mixes with any of them because he wasn't good at mixing. Once I had that light bulb moment, he turned around, went really simple, and then they got better that way. It's kind of a progression. The fancy plugins don't do you much good if you don't know what you're doing. Once you know what you're doing, you could probably take advantage of the fancy plugins, or you might just stick with what you've got because you're too busy making music to worry about what's the latest plugin. People always ask me, what's a great new blah, 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 and I just don't know because I don't really pay attention Aside from maybe PreSonus and what they've got new, which, by the way, they just announced today that the new the DAW mode is out on the Studio Live, at least a beta version, so i got to check that out. I'll be talking about that in future episodes. But um, other than that, I don't pay much attention because I'm too busy 
doing my music, making music, sticking, using what I've got. Does that make sense? Okay. Great. Um, what's in my tumbler? Coffee. Mm. Black coffee. Just to be real American since we had that nice tea-drinking British opener. Love you, Ben. Uh, Mark says, when I connect an external preamp to my Studio Live 24 Classic, should the gain on the mixer be all the way left or set to Unity? Well, the cool thing about those, the, the original Classic, which is the one I had before this one, it has a line input. So make sure you plug into that, the quarter-inch line input, not the XLR mic input. And then it will still have a trim control. So you, then you would set it to Unity, which is essentially it's going through some sort of an amp, but it, at Unity, it's not adding or taking away any level. It's just a straight line input. They give you that because sometimes you need a little extra boost or maybe you're really driving that preamp to get a certain sound, but it's clipping the input of the mixer so you could turn it down. I've done that before on accident and got a really cool sound. So yeah, set it to Unity and then kind of go from there. And you're kind of setting your levels based on the meter on the mixer with the, that input set to Unity and then using the output of the preamp to kind of set your level going in. What are your thoughts on reamping? I think I love the idea of reamping. I almost never do it. I actually bought one of the what was the light blue X amp or whatever the radial product for reamping. I bought one. So was super excited. I don't think I ever used it. I just for me, it's part of it's probably a laziness thing. Part of it's probably a it's just not something that I love to do. But I prefer to just get it right on the front end. Like even with when I use this laptop and I set it over here, plug it into that keyboard and run main stage, which is just a set of just simple virtual instrument keyboard sounds, I don't use MIDI. I just, I mean, I use MIDI to trigger it, but I don't record MIDI into Studio One. I record it with audio cables out of that interface into my mixer, and that's how I get my keyboard sounds, just like if I had an actual keyboard that I was playing. That's just the way I like to work. I like backing myself into that corner and just playing it in. Same thing with guitar. There are occasions where I might add a delay after the fact if I'm just not quite sure if it fits the song. But otherwise, delays and reverbs, if you go listen to my EP, Fighter, all those guitars, there's lots of reverb on, on those guitars. That's all in my pedal board. That's the sound that we recorded. I mixed it a little bit. I may have added a little more reverb to some of the parts, but that's pretty much the sound. So for me, reamping can be great, and there are people who do it and do it well. For me, I know a lot of people will record a direct signal as an, and think about, I'm going to reamp this later, and they use that as an excuse not to worry about getting good tone today. If you have some sort of catastrophic thing happen where you act, forgot to record the amp, you just had the wrong input selected, and all you've got is a DI signal, but the guy played a great part and he's moved back to Australia and you live in Washington, D.C., then yeah, it's great that you've got that DI track that you can then reamp and save the day. I don't do that. I probably should sometimes, but I would just rather put a mic in front of the amp and go get the sounds that we want. You're not wrong if you do it the other way. That's just my personal preference. Just like some people like Les Pauls and some people like Stratocasters. I'm a Les Paul 335 humbucker guy. Um, I'm probably not good enough to be a Strat guy, although I bet I, I have a sneaky suspicion I would love a Strat if I got one, but I'm just not a Strat guy. Do do do. What would you What would you ask to one of your favorite mixers and engineers? Um, I would want to know what their biggest struggle is in their current state of having achieved whatever level of success they're at. I want to know what their typical not what their typical day looks like, but what when they're what triggers them to feel inadequate, insecure, like how do those manifest themselves at that level of success? Because we all have this idea, and I, I'm, this could be crazy, but you may even feel that about me. Like you're watching me do things on YouTube, and I look like I know what I'm doing, so you probably think that guy just knows what he's doing. I have crippling insecurity all the time, and I think we all do. I've known people who have lots of success in the music world, and they are just as insecure about what they're doing as I am on a given day. I think it's a part of being creative, but I think it's also just a part of being human. So I would um, I would want to know, and they, they probably wouldn't answer and be uncomfortable with the question, but I'd like to know, like, hey, Chris Lord Algae, what keeps you up at night? Not what keeps you up at night, that's not really it, but what, what do you struggle with when it comes to success and your strengths and weaknesses and, and insecurity and all those things? How does that manifest for someone with so many obvious wins as you have? 
because we have this idea that if you get so many wins and you reach a certain level, just it's all a bed of roses, Care Bears and rainbows. And it's, it's not. Like We know deep down it's not, and I'd like to hear more of that from the people up top because I think that would just, I would feel more connected and I'd also feel more like, okay, I can get there too. If this guy's insecure, turns out being not insecure is not the secret. It's what you do in the midst of and in spite of that insecurity that really matters. Really good question, though. Spiro says, I'm often having trouble with finishing projects, and as a result, uh, I probably have 100 unfinished songs. Any tips on reaching set goals? On the other hand, I'm really good at starting projects. And I, I took a personality test years ago, and I don't remember what it was, but I was an I. I don't even know what that means. And it said one of the characteristics was great at starting things, bad at finishing. And it could have been a self-fulfilling prophecy at that point because I was pretty young, but it seemed true and it has proved to be very true for me. I'm great at starting stuff. I get excited. I get all in and I'm bad at the consistency and the follow through. It, part of it's just your personality, but you, you have to kind of figure out ways to shore up those weaknesses. Um, you don't need to focus all on your weaknesses. I think you focus on your strengths, but obviously if you're not finishing anything, that's, a, that's like a catastrophic weakness that needs to be fixed and repaired. One of the things I talked about at the beginning of this episode was who do you have in your life that you tell your aspirations to and then ask them to hold you accountable? That's a pretty powerful thing, whether it's publicly on like social media or a, a friend or your spouse or girlfriend or whatever, boyfriend. Um, that can be a really powerful thing. But you also just need, it just needs to be a decision that you are going to keep a commitment because what's happening is you have all these unfinished projects and I would bet that these are projects that you are doing for yourself. Like this is your music, um, your pet project, it's your own thing. And if this was a project for somebody else, I'm guessing, especially if they had hired you and paid you money to do this project, you wouldn't have left it unfinished. But for some reason, when you do projects for yourself, you don't hold yourself to any sort of a standard and you give your, you're too lax with yourself and you give yourself too many breaks. I think you have to, and that's, you may think, it's, oh, it's just not a big deal. I would take, you know, I think of other people more highly than myself. Well, maybe, but it, I think it's you don't take yourself seriously enough and you don't respect yourself enough. So in learning how to love and respect yourself, that means you got to keep commitments to yourself. And that means you take, pick one of those projects that's not finished and don't work on anything else until it's finished. Sometimes I kind of punish myself in that way. If I've gotten too scatterbrained, even this week I did a little bit of trying too many things at once, I will stop and I'll say, you can't work on anything else until this one project is finished. Like finished, finished, done finished. Not close to finished, not almost finished, not wow, I made a lot of progress, now I can take a break for three weeks finished. I mean done. You can check the box that says this is done. Now, real life doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you do have multiple things going on at once and that's fine. But the more you can, especially if you're in this kind of place where you aren't finishing stuff and you've admitted that, you need to pick one and you need to literally pick a studio project and you may not touch anything else in your studio, any work on any other project, even like for just 10 minutes until this project is done. Because what you'll find is it's going to be difficult. You're going to be like sitting there for five minutes, then jump on your computer or your phone and get on Facebook just to just to escape because it's pressure and you don't like it. But once you push through that and finish, it is an amazing feeling. Whether it turns out great or not, just the fact that you finished it is a great, great thing that I'm guessing you haven't experienced. And the more you experience it, the more likely you're going to be to push through and actually get to the finished project. And the more you finish, the more you will finish. It's this great feedback loop that just keeps you moving in the direction you want to go. So uh, those are some ideas and strategies, but you just got to, you got to decide if you want to do it. Do you want to do this or not? If the answer is no, great. Sell your studio stuff, go buy a boat, enjoy sail sailing, or, you know, become a really good bowler. But if music is really the thing you love and are passionate about, then do it and finish it and like get in there and make it happen it's a great great question thank you for being honest i think a lot of us could use a little more honesty in our own lives last question um ben Holmes says ben who did our intro says is there one thing you would like to get better at in relation to hsc or studio work i would like to get better at planning ahead and working on bigger projects that take more time and people my default is to kind of hide in a room and do it myself. I'd like that to change. I'm out of time. See ya. <laughs>